Venezuelans rally on Wednesday to mark 20 years of the popular victory against the 2002 coup. Russia's defense ministry said on Wednesday that more than a thousand soldiers of Ukraine's 36 Marine Brigade, including 162 officers, had surrendered in the port city of Mariupol. Israel continued its escalating violence against the Palestinians. This Wednesday, security forces raided the northern West Bank, leaving one dead and at least 20 wounded. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, from the Telesur Studios in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with the news. Stay with us. And now we begin. In Venezuela, citizens mobilized this Wednesday to commemorate the people's victory after the coup in 2002. Political organizations and social movements marched on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the rescue of the national dignity and to ratify the will of the Venezuelan people to be free, sovereign and independent. The country also celebrated the day of the Bolivarian Armed Forces created from the popular mobilization together with the actions of the loyal military men that put an end to the coup on April 11, 2002. The coup, promoted by the opposition and in complicity with high-ranking military officers, church leaders and the private media, conspired to oust Commander Hugo Chavez and destroy the Bolivarian Revolution. We move on to other topics. The police guild in El Salvador has denounced that police chiefs are demanding from officers to commit irregularities. The denunciation was made amid raids deployed by the national executive to control gangs in the country. Agents taking part in these raids say these commanders are demanding a certain number of captures per day, regardless of whether in order for or to fulfill that quota, it may be necessary to commit arbitrary acts or even break the law, like by depriving innocent people of their freedom, without any kind of process or judicial precedent. Police Guild Representative Marvin Reyes said that under the state of exception decreed in El Salvador, police chiefs are being forced to fabricate false testimonies against a number of people arrested. According to government figures, at least 10,000 alleged gang members have been arrested so far. The thing is that it seems impossible to determine whether there are gang structures, so it is very difficult to prove a certain individual actually belongs to a gang. Police officers are lacking character in not being able to tell their station chief that there simply isn't any gang structure, and therefore they should not be making any arrest. So they are being asked upon arresting an individual whose gang membership cannot be clearly established that they should lie on the arrest report and that is illegal. In Mexico, the National Migration Institute reported that a total of 133 asylum seekers from Guatemala, Nicaragua and Honduras were found cramped in a refrigerated container on a tractor trailer in the state of San Luis Potosí in central Mexico. The immigration agents requested the support of the National Defense Department and the state police to locate and stop the unit where the migrants were being transported. Once located, these migrants were unable to provide any paperwork or the, of them being legally allowed to stay in Mexican territories. The group was made up to 127 Guatemalan citizens, four people from Nicaragua and two from Honduras. The group included 15 unaccompanied minors. The travel of migrants crammed into trucks or trailers is considered Consider one of the most dangerous ways to cross into the United States illegally. And the Mexican president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, presented his report on the first 100 days of his administration in 2022. The president invited the people and the political forces of the country to advance towards a welfare state. <laughs> 
In a ceremony that took place in the courtyard in honor to the National Palace, accompanied by his entire cabinet before representatives from several institutions and special guests, López Obrador gave a detailed account of the administration's performance during the first months of this year. He said the greatest success of this period had been the reduction of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, other than successfully implemented initiatives to contain violence. He also preferred to the, referred to the presidential recall referendum and thanked his people for their support. Here the reports presented by the president including favorable economic performance data. Despite the pandemic and the conflict in Ukraine, he said foreign investment in Mexico reached an all-time high. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Hola, ¿qué tal? Sean todos muy bienvenidos a Vida. Hay lugares donde el arte se unifica con el orgullo de los pueblos. Y esos lugares están llenos de colores, alegría, pasión, tradiciones, arraigo, valor y entrega. Real Life Friday Only on Telesur Welcome back to From the South. Russia's Defense Ministry said on Wednesday that more than a thousand soldiers of Ukraine's 36th Marine Brigade, including 162 officers, had surrendered in the port city of Mariupol. The ministry said in a statement that the soldiers surrender as a result of successful offensives by Russian armed forces and Donetsk People's Republic militia units. If the Russian troops seize the Adsovsal industrial district, where the Marines have been holed up, they will be in full control of the port, the link between Russian-held areas to the west and east and providing a land corridor for Russian troops and supplies. And Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, proposed swapping captured pro-Kremlin political Viktor Medveshchuk for Ukrainian prisoners held by Russia's forces as the conflict between the two countries approaches its seventh week. Kiev announced earlier capturing Med Medveshchuk, who escaped from house arrest after Russia began its military operation. He is the leader of Ukraine's opposition platform for Life Party and had been under house arrest since 2021 after Ukrainian authorities accused him of treason. During a televised address on Wednesday, the Ukrainian head of state said he offered the Russian Federation this exchange and emphasized it was important that the law enforcement and military also consider the possibility of this action. I think it is especially cynical of him to use military camouflage. He tried to disguise himself like that, such a soldier, such a patriot. I propose to the Russian Federation to exchange this guy of yours for our boys and girls, who are now in Russian captivity. Now we continue. On Wednesday, the presidents of Poland, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia arrived in the Ukrainian capital Kiev for a meeting with President Volodymyr Zelensky. The meeting will take place after German President Frank Walter Steinmeier was informed during a meeting with his Polish counterpart that his presence was not wanted in Kiev because of his long-standing ties with the German-Russian Nord Stream gas pipeline. The president regrets the response of the Ukrainian presidency, especially since the purpose of his visit was to express solidarity with the country. And the Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby did not support the claim against Russian troops by the Ukrainian neo-Nazi Azov battalion, confirmed by President Volodymyr Zelensky and the United Kingdom authorities about an alleged chemical attack. 
Kirby assured that the U.S. Department of Defense could not confirm the accuracy of this accusation. According to the information, the Russian forces would have carried out a chemical attack in the port city of Mariupol. The neo-Nazi Azov Battalion issued a statement claiming the Russian army had launched an unknown chemical substance on the Azov Dal metallurgical plant. They also said that soldiers suffered respiratory problems, eye irritation and dizziness. This accusation was also supported by the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, and by his defense ministry. And amidst the special military operation by the Russian forces in Ukraine, the French President Emmanuel Macron on Wednesday refused to term Kremlin's actions a genocide. In a televised interview with the public broadcaster France 2, the French leader stated that, unlike United States President Joe Biden, he did not want to use the term genocide for the casualties that had occurred during the military operation. Macron noted that he wanted to refrain from using the term as Russians and Ukrainians are brothers. French President further asserted that he did not want to indulge in the world play and also said that he rather wanted to stop the conflict at the earliest. And the government of Finland will decide in the next few weeks on its possible entry into NATO. The Prime Minister of Finland, Sanna Marin, announced at a press conference with her counterparts from Sweden, Magdalena Andersson, that next week she will hear a report in her country's parliament on the nation's eventual entry into the transatlantic alliance. Marin expressed the hope that both Finland and Sweden, which is also considering joining the Western military bloc, will make the same decision on the issue. Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zaharova said that the entry of both countries into NATO will not be in the interests of the people of Finland and Sweden, but in the interest of the U.S. and its allies. In Serbia, people residing in facilities of the former Samjiste Nazi concentration camp may soon be evicted as real estate developers have their eye on the area. Our correspondent Brian Muir has the story. During the 1990s, thousands of primarily Roma and Bosnian refugees occupied the ruins of the former Nazi concentration camp of Samisti in Belgrade, Serbia. As capitalist real estate speculation spins out of control in the surrounding neighborhood, its 2,500 residents are now afraid they're about to be evicted. Of course there will be evictions. Well, I assume there will be evictions and that we people here will have to move. I don't know where or how. I don't think this part of the old camp will be residential. A legacy of Yugoslavia's socialist years, Serbia still has the second highest level of home ownership in Europe, trailing only Romania. Within the last decade, the neoliberal dismantlement of housing rights has created an eviction crisis. People who are now living in a former concentration camp, they are in a situation that they are living in the property that was nationalized after the revolution in 1945. And the regulations are that they have some abstract right to be moved to some other place. So the only thing that is standing between uh, uh, them and eviction at some point where investors would be interested in it is the solidarity of, of, of the larger public. Brian Mir, tell us, sir. Belgrade. And we have more news and stories coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. Israel continued its escalating violence against Palestinians. This Wednesday, security forces raided the northern West Bank, leaving one dead and at least 20 wounded. The victim was Mohammed Hazan Azaf, 34 years old, who died after receiving several gunshot wounds to the chest, as confirmed by the Palestinian Health Ministry. Likewise, the emergency ambulance services of the Red Crescent explained there were five wounded with combat ammunition and many others with rubber bullets. In addition to several affected by tear gas and ran over by a military vehicle. Mahmoud Barhan, the mayor of the town of Bida, said that several dozen soldiers stormed about 20 homes and attacked with live ammunition those who protested against police brutality. In less than a week, the occupying forces have killed five Palestinians, among them a mother of six children and a minor.
and Iran summoned Afghanistan's envoy in Tehran over attacks on Iranian diplomatic missions in the neighboring country. Iran's foreign ministry has reportedly summoned the Afghan charge to affairs following Monday's attacks on the Iranian embassy in Kabul and the Iranian consulate in Herat, where demonstrations over the alleged torture of Afghan refugees in Iran had turned aggressive. The ministry demanded that Afghanistan's new Taliban rulers provide the missions with fuel security and said they stopped working until further notice. On Monday, ministry spokesperson Saeed Katiz Abdeh said more needed to be done by the Taliban to ensure security to Iranian missions. Now we address other topics. At least 25 people have died so far in landslides and floods in the Philippines after tropical storm Maggie swept the nation. On Tuesday, rescue crews were still battling to retrieve people stranded on the eastern and southern coasts. Maggie hit the archipelago on Sunday with winds of up to 65 kilometers per hour. More than 13,000 people fled to higher ground shelters as the storm lashed the east coast. Heavy rains and winds knocked out power supply, flooded homes and fields, and caused mudslides in villages. Maggie is the first storm in this year to hit the archipelago, which sees around 20 such storms annually. And according to the records from the Johns Hopkins University, which continuously monitors the pandemic, the world has surpassed 500 million cases of SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus infections. The university's website has reported that there are 500,363,741 cases of the coronavirus on a global scale, of which more than 6 million have died. The Higher Learning Institution has reported that the United States remains the country with the most infections registered so far, with an estimated 80 million, followed by India and Brazil, with more than 43 and 30 million cases respectively. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.